um, he, you know, he refused to adapt and sharpen his arguments. And um, the sort of failure to participate with regular science, you know, we have peer reviewing of proposals, we have peer reviewing of books. He did publish some books with major presses that were probably peer reviewed. But these things can really help you sharpen your argument. Even if your critics don't agree with you, you figure out ways to better address the critique. And um, he worked so hard, you know, for this idea, at least his idea of scientific legitimacy, that he really probably never, um, never got. Um, Part of um, the more recent critique um, points out kind of the dark side of a lot of his ideas. And um, this was this idea of a white race, a civilized white race kind of taking civilization and introducing it to other parts of the world, um, such as the Andes. You know, and the idea here is they couldn't develop it on their own, had to come from somewhere else. Um, or the case of Polynesia being settled by these folk later generations crossing the Pacific. And um, he used these images over and over and over again. These are moche pots from about 500 AD, um, and supposedly depicting um, ancient Peruvians with hair. Um, and so Peruvians tend to not have much facial hair. Um, and he argued that you know, this guy's little goatee and the beard on this guy was evidence um, of, you know, physical evidence of this race that had colonized South America and later Polynesia. Um, now, does, does his ideas that some people have actually called racist, um, do they just reflect the times, you know, that he had? Um, his new biographer, Axel Anderson, points out probably not. I mean, he, this was post-World War II, and part of the reason the war was fought was because of the racism and ethnocide that was occurring in Europe. And, um, you know, that was becoming even more aware of the public after the war. And um, he was aware... He was aware of these critiques um, uh, early in his career, but he, he ignored them. And some of the implications of a lot of his theory that people pointed out is the, essentially he's saying that the indigenous peoples of the Americas and Polynesia were incapable of developing civilization on their own and had to be taught by more knowledgeable outsiders. And in some ways, this you know, also denies native peoples of their own accomplishments in monumental architecture, engineering, technology, astronomy, and art. Now, did Thor Heyerdahl directly uh, impact and result in Native peoples losing their lands, their rights, their resources? No, but um, much of the world still sort of supports um, this kind of dark side of hyper-diffusionism. And the, there's a lot of popular literature on this. If you can go to any bookstore, even the Penn Bookstore, and look under archaeology or cult or religion, you'll see uh, uh, finding you know, examples, maybe multiple books on these topics that are quite popular. Um, some of the um, comparisons that he used in some of his books of um, modern day peoples on um, the island, Easter Island. You know, Easter Island had a lot of people visiting it through the colonial period, um, intermarrying, and most of the people were taken off the island as slaves and to uh, mine the guano. Um, uh, islands off of Peru for fertilizer, and then people reintroduced to it. So a lot of this really doesn't hold up that well. Now, let's look at just briefly at the end here to kind of summarize some new work um, and some new publications that say that maybe Heyerdahl was correct about the possible Trans-Pacific contact, but maybe in the opposite direction. And I learned about this at the Society for American Archaeology meetings in 2010. Uh, there was a morning and afternoon session um, well attended, big auditorium, almost twice the size of this, and um, lots and lots of discussion of new research being done along the Pacific coast, but in particular Chile. A lot of this work focuses on Mocha Island, 30 kilometers off the Chilean coast, where a number of skeletal remains and crania have been found from pre-Columbian sites that are said to match Polynesian features. Now, this is kind of a dangerous thing to be comparing a you know, handful of skulls to sort of um, recreate, you know, the connections across to Polynesia. But it's not just this. And um, in addition, on the coast, not far from here, is a site called Arenal, where they found chicken bones. Chickens. You know, who cares about chickens? 
Well, there's this long-standing debate whether chickens were brought in by Europeans uh, from the Old World and distributed throughout the Americas. It, you know, it's an incredible animal, uh, very easy to keep, um, eats almost everything, you know, doesn't require a lot of work, it produces great meat, great eggs. And so, um, you know, you can see why any culture that had access to it would probably adopt it. And, um, but all the accounts, there aren't a lot of accounts, but accounts were dismissed of any pre-Columbian possibility that they were in the Americas before. And the consensus was outside. This new site has great archeological context to show that, um, that the dates that are between 1300 AD and 1450, late prehistory, um, that are in different strata with chicken bones that are dated that can tell us that, that these were probably either a settlement there, that they haven't determined that, or multiple peoples from Polynesia may have been coming to this island over uh, quite a long period of time. Alice Story, um, just an incredible publisher, she just got in a couple of articles last week or the week before that I read. Um, she's looking at the DNA of chickens and documenting them to try to distinguish the Asian chicken from the African chicken and figure out which routes. She's arguing that it was the Asian chicken that ends up on these sites in Chile. Um, there's some other scholars that are arguing against her, but it shows sort of the power of debate and the you know, marshalling of evidence and making different arguments. Interesting material traits, and I can only just summarize a couple here, uh, some of the more interesting ones. Um, so on the top are New Zealand, Maori, um, what are called hand clubs, about this big, they're kind of heavy, uh, probably used for ritual purposes, but they could have been used in hand-to-hand -hand combat, um, used in all kinds of rituals in Polynesia, especially um, in New, New Zealand. And then at the bottom are ones from Chile. Now, the problem here, as far as I know, none of these have good archaeological context. They, they're in museums and stuff. And they're associated with a culture called the Mapuche, which speak a very different language from all of the other languages in the Andes. And they're very independent people. They were the only uh, ethnic group that resisted the Inca Empire and held out against them, um, battle after battle after battle. Um, on the right is one from our incredible collection from Polynesia, a uh, fancy one uh, made of whale bone. Also, these uh, were called celts. They're kind of like heavy, um, they're probably adzes for uh, doing woodworking, maybe as hatchets um, or axe heads. And some of them probably were just ritual, but they have a very distinctive polished shape. Um, and um, the name in both Maipuche and also Polynesia is Tokai. Now, could be that we know that slaves from Easter Island and probably other islands were dragged to South America to do work for the Spaniards various times. So it could be they brought these things with them, kind of hard to believe slaves would bring it. Um, uh, or this could have been, you know, uh, after, after the world was known um, that Polynesian travelers, you know, know, we know that South America is there, so we'll go and sort of distribute these things. Also, along the Pacific coast, there's a very distinctive form of fish hook. They're about this big, probably for deep sea fishing. And it's kind of remarkable. The shapes and sizes are made of sometimes of wood, sometimes of stone, if you can believe it, and then also of shell. Um, and so you can see the differences there uh, between the two areas, Polynesia and California, and they show kind of remarkable similarity. And then also the sewn plank boat. And it's Pretty rare in the Americas, the Chumash of Southern California um, near the Channel Islands have um, this. No other society on the Pacific Coast has this. They use reed boats instead. And so it kind of stands out as a distinctive trait. It's also only found in Southern Chile along the coast, another area of suspected Polynesian landfall. Terry Jones has written about this and working with a colleague who's a linguist, has found all kinds of names and similarities um, of the boat parts and things with Polynesian languages. I find this a little less convincing. But you can see some of the differences in the boats. Um, the California ones tend to be much smaller than the Polynesian boats. So what they're arguing here is that Polynesian